Great, so I think we're getting started. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, I can see nods, fantastic. Sorry for the slightly nasally voice. I do have a cold, so I might drink water halfway through. But thank you for coming along to my presentation on reacting to the future of application architecture. If anyone thought this was a React.js talk, now is your time to sneak out. I'll pretend I don't see you. Uh, so my name is Grace Jansen, and I'm a developer advocate at IBM. There's a theme going on in this talk. So I'm going to be presenting today sort of a, I hope, a fun and interesting analogy using bees to explain why I think uh, reactive architecture is the future of application architecture. So to look at the future of application architecture, we first have to look at the past. So we've moved from these monolithic applications to microservices. Now, you're all at DevOps. You all know about this already. And probably a lot of you, in fact, most of you are probably already on microservices. And this was a fantastic move. Um, we moved because in monolithic, when, when we first started building applications, monolithic architecture was fine. We had small applications. We weren't dealing with that many services. We weren't dealing with that much data. It all worked pretty well. And then we started growing our applications. And it all kind of went a bit wrong. Um, our applications became humongous. And trying to debug errors, trying to introduce new features, trying to update versions became pretty much impossible. So we moved to microservices. And this helped to solve a lot of those problems. But we're still facing problems. Modern users in this modern society are still expecting more. I can still go to a concert ticket website and suddenly get kicked off the queue and not get tickets because their website crashed. I can still go to a shopping cart and lose an item because someone else bought it, even though it should have been reserved for me. And I can still go to a website on Black Friday or Christmas Eve and find that I can't access it because the load on the system's too much that their applications failed. Nowadays, modern users expect a lot more. We expect, as a society, to be able to access any of these applications and have the same user experience, regardless of the day of the week or the time of the month or when I'm using it or what I'm trying to do. So how do we solve these new expectations? How do we meet these new demands? Well, to see it for an answer, I looked to nature as inspiration. So I come from an unusual background. Um, I actually did a biology degree. So I enjoy uh, translating any technology principles or technologies that I learn into uh, things that I understand in the natural world and that I can see analogies between. So I thought bees were a really great example of an analogy to describe microservices and our applications. Bees are these incredibly complicated systems that appear simplistic. They're individuals that each have uh, individual responsibilities and roles, but they actually work towards the greater good of the single hive. So just like our microservices, they each have specific roles, but they all play a part in an entire system that has one goal, the success of the hive. And so I'm going to take you through three behaviors that bees show that I think we want in our applications. And then I promise you, I'm not just ranting about bees. I'll link that to software. <laughs> So the first example is food foraging. So bees have this, as I said, it's actually really complicated in a beehive. And they each have specific roles. Uh, you can be an undertaker bee, a nurse bee. There are even air conditioning bees. Now, one of those roles is the scalp bee. And the scalp bee's role is to go out and try and find food sources, so plants that they can get um, pollen from or nectar. And what they do is when the, when the scalp bee finds a successful food source, so a successful flower, they dash back to the hive and they make their way to these dedicated dance floors. And they basically just wiggle their butts around to communicate with the other listener bees where that flower is. Now, they have a really complicated dance structure, which means they can, they can communicate loads of different facts about this food source. They can communicate where it is, how far it is, and they can even communicate the wind speed it's going to take to get there, so the amount of energy those bees will expend getting to that food source. And when they get to this dance floor, the really important part is these listener bees around the dance floor are already there waiting for this, this scout to get back with that information. Now, as soon as these listener bees have the minimum information they need to get to that food source, they immediately dash off to get that food. They are extremely responsive in this situation, and that's mega important because it's literally a life or death situation for them. If they don't get to that food source first, another beehive could get there, steal the food, and now they don't have any food. So it's really important that these bees are as responsive as possible. And we want the same from our applications. 
We want our, okay, maybe it's not a life or death situation, but we want our applications to be as responsive as possible for our users. So we want to mimic this responsiveness that bees already show. Now, the second example is, okay, what happens when the queen bee dies? Like I mentioned, bees have loads of different roles, one of which is the queen, and there's only ever one queen. Now, the whole role of the queen is to produce little baby bees for the hive to continue. So no queen, no baby bees, no future hive. So the queen is arguably the most important member of that society. So what happens in the potentially catastrophic situation that she dies? Well, the, beehives don't, the bees in the beehive don't stop working, the system doesn't shut down, they don't crash, they continue as normal because what they're able to do is they have this innate trust that a set of instructions will be put in place to replace that queen. So what happens when the queen dies is while she's alive, she produces these pheromone signals, so these chemical signals to the rest of the beehive. And when she's dying or dies, those pheromone signals disappear. And that's a key sign for the whole hive that that queen is gone, she's dead. So what they do is the nurse of bees that usually look after the queen actually go and pick about four or five larvae that haven't hatched yet. They're about three days old and they start feeding them royal jelly. Now this royal jelly is what turns them into the queen. So as soon as the first one hatches, she brutally murders the others, but then goes on to become the queen. So within 30 days, those bees have been able to replace that essentially important member of the hive. The rest of the bees in that time have continued as normal. They've gone out to find food. They've done their air conditioning. They've gone and like, built the rest of the hive for the other bees. So they're extremely resilient in the face of what could have been a catastrophic failure. And we want the same for our applications. We want our applications to be resilient in the face of any failure, regardless of how important that individual component within our system was. So we need to enable this decoupling, just like the bees do, to enable this resiliency in the face of any failure. Now, the third behavior I'm going to explain is what happens when a beehive is at war. So, as I explained, loads of different roles within the hive. And one of those roles is a guard bee. Now, the role of the guard bee is kind of obvious, they're there to protect the hive. But usually, only about 11% of a hive are guard bees. Now, imagine you're going to have something bigger than this worm attacking the hive. Let's imagine a bear is trying to get at my honey. Now, 11% of a beehive probably isn't going to cut it for a massive bear coming at your hive. Bees aren't that big, you're going to need more than 11%. So what the bee guards actually do is they go back into the hive and they recruit more bees to dynamically switch roles to be able to become guard bees temporarily. So they can elastically change their roles and their responsibilities dependent on the load to their system. So depending on the load to the hive, the threat to the hive. So um, be it a nurse bee, an undertaker bee, whatever your role was, you can switch to be a guard bee, and those numbers increase exponentially during that time period, enough to be able to deter the bear away. Now, as soon as that threat to the system is gone, as soon as that load's decreased, those bees then go back to become whatever they were before, whatever role they were doing. So they're able to elastically change their resource allocation depending on the load. Again, that's exactly what we want from our applications. We want to have an efficient use of our resources to deal with the different loads in our system um, and what that load requires. So if I've got a restaurant app and I've got tons of people trying to book a table and almost no one paying, I must have awful food, but I don't want wasted resources on the payment system when I could be using them to better um, suit the, people, the load on the system, which is to my book a table system. So we want to be able to mimic this elasticity to increase the efficiency of our resources within our system. Now, I promised this wasn't just a rant about bees. It does relate to software. So has anyone heard of the reactive manifesto before? A few hands. Great, fantastic. So hopefully you understand where this diagram's going. So the reactive manifesto, for those who haven't heard of it before, is a specification that was written in 2013 by a guy called Jonas Bonner and a few of his colleagues. And it was designed to basically set out a set of um, rules or instructions or cornerstones as to how to make a successful reactive system, a successful reactive application. And it's based off four cornerstones. And if you can't tell already from my diagram, it relates to the behaviors I just described. So the first of those cornerstones is the first behavior I described, so the dancing bees. Responsiveness. 
If you're going to build a reactive application, you need to be able to respond to events in that system as soon as possible. I don't want my user clicking away because they had no response from my system. A happy user is a user that gets a response immediately. So to build reactive applications, we have to build responsive applications, just like the bees had to respond immediately to that food source. Now, the second cornerstone that enables that responsiveness is elasticity. By having an elastic um, resource allocation, we can better respond to events and we can be more reactive as an application. So just like the bees are able to elastically change roles, we need our resource as allocation to elastically change to, to deal with the different loads on the system to be able to respond better to them. Now, the other cornerstone that enables responsiveness is resiliency. So if our applications aren't resilient in the face of failure, there's no point worrying about being responsive because our application's going to have gone down. So if we want our applications to be responsive and reactive, we have to be resilient to any failure that could happen in our application. So by combining elasticity and resiliency, we enable this responsiveness that we want from our applications. But how do we achieve elasticity and resiliency? Well, it's all underpinned by the last cornerstone, which, if you can't tell from my image already, is messages. So bees already do this. Bees can communicate both on a one-to-one -one and on a one-to-many basis with, with, the bees in the other, in the, with the other bees in the beehive using asynchronous messaging. So this asynchronicity allows us to decouple the need to wait for a response with that message. And by using messages, we can broadcast to many or one at the same time. So when the guard bee came back um, into the hive, they can communicate on a one-to-one -one level with each bee they pass to communicate that they need them to change roles and become guards. Now, those guard bees don't wait for a response. They don't go into the hive and say, hey, could you become a guard bee and wait? because that would take forever. And so instead, they just know that these, would, these other bees will elastically change roles um, to deal with that load because they're all, they all have a common aim of trying to make the hive better and protect the hive. And with the dancer bee, for example, that dancer bee is able to communicate on a one-to-many basis. So the many listener bees listening to that one dancer, again, that dancer doesn't listen for a response. It doesn't wait. It carries on dancing, and it knows the listener bees will react. We want the same from our application. We need this asynchronous messaging backbone in order to enable the rest of the reactive manifesto. So why do I think it's the future of application architecture? Well, it seems to kind of solve a lot of the issues I was mentioning. The fact that users still have systems that go down, the fact that I can have things lost in a shopping cart, or the fact that I get kicked out of queue, the fact that I can't access applications on when it, there's a high load on the system. Reactive architecture seems to be trying to solve those issues. So that's why I think it's at least a potential solution to the problems we're trying to solve. So what do I mean by reactive architecture? Has anyone heard of reactive programming? Great, a few more hands. Yeah, so you've kind of proven my point for me. A lot, of, a lot more people have heard of reactive programming than they have reactive architecture, reactive manifesto, reactive systems. There's a difference. So what people, the pitfall that many people fall into is they think that by implementing reactive programming, you create a reactive system. And although reactive programming is a fantastic tool, it's not in isolation. It doesn't in isolation create a reactive system. So I'm going to explain it with the bees, hopefully. So if you imagine bees playing football, you've got two different teams. Anyone support football here? Great, so you know the rules. So with football, let's imagine you've got a team of Lionel Messi, arguably a really good player. Now, Let's imagine we've duplicated him and you've got an entire team full of Lionel Messi. Now, he might be the best scorer, he might be the best tackler, he might be the best at dribbling up the field. But as a team, they've never played together. They have no idea how the other members of that team, the other Lionel Messis, are going to respond when they do a particular action on the ball. If I boot up the field, I have no idea what the rest of that team are going to do because I've never played with them before. So although individually they're extremely reactive and able to react to the events on the field, as a team they have no innate trust in the way that the others are going to respond to that and react. They have no reactivity between the different players on their team. So that's what reactive programming is. So reactive programming is a really useful tool for internal logic within a microservice. It enables that microservice to be reactive but it doesn't enable reactivity between the different components, between the different microservices in our system. 
To do that, we have to think on the system level, not just the microservices or component level. So let's imagine the other team. Let's imagine we've got a team full of, let's say, middle of the range players, but they've been playing together for over 30 years. So they know exactly how the other members of their team are going to respond. They've got set plays, they practice every weekend together, they play in the local league. They know exactly what the others are going to do when they boot up the field. So imagine you combined the two. Imagine you had a team of Lionel Messi's who had played together for over 30 years. You'd have an awesome team. You might even win. But importantly, you've got reactivity in the individuals, but you've also got reactivity between the components. Each individual is an excellent player, and as a team, they know exactly how the others are going to res respond. That's what we want to achieve. We want to use reactive programming as a tool to enable reactive systems, but we have to be thinking on this system level to be able to achieve complete reactivity and non-blocking. So, how do we enable these reactive behaviors? I couldn't avoid one pun. So I'm going to take you through some methodologies um, and common frameworks that we often use when we're building reactive applications. Now, you've probably seen some of these before. They're not um, just exclusive to reactive, but they are useful when we're trying to implement the reactive manifesto. Now, this isn't an exhaustive list, because if it was, you'd never go home. And I know we all eventually want to go home. So I've just picked some of the commonly used ones, um, and I'm going to use bees as an analogy to hopefully explain them all. So the first one I was going to go through is domain-driven design. Now, a lot of you will have heard of this already. Um, I'm going to explain it with the bees. So when we say domain-driven design, a domain is essentially a sphere of knowledge. That's what it means. So domain-driven design is just driving the design of your application based on those different spheres, those different business areas. Um, and it's a really useful tool for breaking down a monolith, for example, if you're still a monolith and you want to go down to microservice. So you can actually split them based on bounded contexts. So if we take the example of bees, in this example, I've split them down into three different areas, three domains. So you've got the queen bees, the drones, and the worker bees. Queen bee, the one who produces the baby. Drone bees are the one who, they're the males in the hive. They literally mate and then die, unfortunately. And then you've got the workers, they're the females. So that's when it gets interesting. So the queen bees can't do what the drones do, the drones can't do what the workers do, and the workers can't do what the other two do, and vice versa. They're completely separate domains. They can't switch to be the other. Now, the worker bee is where it gets interesting, because the generic worker bee is the one who turns into all of those specific roles that I mentioned. So a worker bee can turn into a nurse bee, or a guard bee, or an undertaker bee, or a caretaker bee. There are tons of different roles. But that generic worker bee is our aggregate route for that domain. And that means that she's the one that can turn into anything else, basically. And within that domain, the reason they can switch between the different roles is because they have an innate understanding and this ubiquitous language that enables them to know exactly what the others are doing um, and communicate the fact that they need to switch roles. So by having this ubiquitous language, we're able to communicate within the domain, which is fantastic. But what happens when we're trying to communicate across domains, so across microservices? Well, that's when we need the asynchronous communication. If we don't have asynchronous communication, you are going to get blocking at some point. By having asynchronous communication, it allows us to completely decouple the components of our application. So let's imagine for a minute that bees aren't asynchronous, which we've already discussed they are. But let's imagine they're not for a second. And let's imagine instead of being able to go into the hive as they wish, they now have to go in on a one-by-one -one basis. So they have to wait for the bee in front of them um, to be able to go and empty their pot of honey. Now, you're going to have a queue of bees lined up outside the hive. You're going to get blocking. And what that means is you're wasting resources. Those bees could be out doing something far more useful than waiting in line to enter the hive. Now, asynchronous communication is especially important now more than ever. Because when we first started building applications, we were in this data at rest scenario. It was OK to do batch processing overnight. It was OK to wait overnight to see the results of that batch processing. Nowadays, we're in a data in motion scenario. We need to be responding to data as it comes into our application. And that's not possible with batch overnight processing. So how do we achieve this? How do we achieve this asynchronicity and we achieve this data in motion? Well, a commonly used tool is event sourcing, which is often used with CQRS. 
So event sourcing is just storing a log of events in a system. And those events are usually state changes in the system. And then um, you store the log, and that way you can basically, if the system crashes, you can relook through the log, um, follow those instructions essentially, and you'll get back to where you were. Now it's often used with CQRS. So CQRS stands for Command Query Responsibility Segregation. In layman terms, it basically just means you split out your read and your write databases. Now, we already have this in the way that we work, just like bees do. So you can imagine that each of us has a brain, and that's our own version, that's our own read database for our state of the world. So each of the listener bees here, you can imagine, is the read database. And you can imagine the dancer bee is actually writing to each of the read databases, each of the brains of the listener bee. Now, what that enables by splitting out that read and write is high availability, which is fantastic because that's how we work nowadays. So by having high availability, what it means is if the bees get knocked off course for any reason, like a gust of wind comes along, they don't have to go all the way back to the hive to find out where that flower was. Instead, they can revisit their brains, revisit the read database they have there of the state of the world, find out where that flower was and retrack their course and they can continue on to that flower. So it means that they have this high availability. Now, unfortunately, because they favored high availability, it means they have to compromise on something else. So has anyone heard of the CAP theorem before? Yeah, most hands, great. So if you haven't heard of the CAP theorem, I'd recommend looking it up. It basically characterizes that an application can only ever um, prioritize two of three behaviors. So because we prioritized high availability in this case, it means we have to compromise on our consistency. But that's okay. Most applications prioritize availability over consistency, and that makes sense because we live in an eventually consistent world. So if I update each of your read databases, each of your brains, and actually tell you that I don't draw a single one of these diagrams, and instead it's my mum that draws them, well, I've updated your state of the world, right? But everyone outside has no idea. I could be claiming credit for the drawings in this presentation until you correct them and make them eventually consistent with the fact that, no, no, it's my mum who draws them. So we live in an eventually consistent world, so it makes sense that our applications are also eventually consistent. And bees work in exactly the same way. So let's assume that uh, we've got a bee who's gone to the flower and found out there are actually, there's no more food left. Bees shouldn't go to that flower anymore. So when that bee returns to the hive to communicate that with the rest of the hive, they actually headbutt the dancing bee off the dance floor. So it's an extremely clear signal there's no food left. So what that does is it updates the read database of all of the listener bees still gathered around that hive. Now that's great, they're now consistent. But what about the bees who have already gone off to that flower in a mid-journey? They're not consistent with the state of the system, the state of their world, because they think that there's still food at that flower. That's okay. It's only a couple of bees, and they're going to become eventually consistent. Once they reach that flower and find out, yeah, there's, there's no more food left, they'll update their version of the world and return to the hive to be useful again. So bees, as well as our applications, are eventually consistent, and that's what reactivity enables, this high availability with this eventual consistency. Now, a tool we use to help with that high availability is sharding. So there are different kinds of sharding. There is um, ACCA sharding, which is part of the ACCA framework, which I'll explain later. Um, I'm not covering that, I'm covering database sharding. So sharding essentially means breaking down something into a smaller part. Uh, so shard, uh, when we say sharding in this form, we mean breaking down a database into smaller parts of that database. And what that enables is it enables greater parallelism without collisions. So with bees, bees already shard their version of a database. So if you all imagine a hive, you can imagine the honeycomb structure that they build. But let's imagine for a minute they don't have a honeycomb structure. Let's imagine instead they just have a big vat of honey that they're only allowed to pour into on a one-by-one -one basis again. They have to wait for the bee in front of them. Again, you're going to have blocking, you're going to have a queue of bees forming trying to dump their honey. So instead, what the bees have done is created this honeycomb structure, which enables multiple bees to go into the hive and dump their honey into different cells in parallel. So what that enables is greater availability of that data. And that's what we want from our applications, and that's why we often use sharding to enable that high availability. Now, another tool we often use in reactive applications is back pressure. 
So back pressure is a form of feedback or flow control, and it's basically when the uh, pub the subscribers to events or to data can't keep up with the publishers. So in the case of bees, you can imagine you've got tons of scalp bees coming back with their honey and not enough cells to fill that up. So instead, wouldn't it be great if the bees that build the cells could communicate with the bees that were, produ that were bringing back the honey and say, yo, slow down, we can't keep up, or would you mind coming over and helping us build some more cells? Because otherwise, we're just going to get a huge queue of you guys forming. By providing this feedback, you can prevent the blocking or the bottleneck this is causing. Um, so it's a great form of feedback control to prevent this blocking and the potential crashing of a system due to it. Now, what I like to think of as kind of the opposite is bulk heading. So bulk heading is instead of the, uh, the subscribers to events or data controlling the flow of it, it's instead the publishers. So in this sense, it's the publishers determining the rate of flow of that data or the events. So again, bees already put this into practice. So with the scalp bee, it already puts into practice the rate of bees that should go to that flower. So by communicating how many bees should go and how rich the food source is, they're able to prevent um, unnecessary amounts of bees going to those flowers. And that's mainly to protect the, the limited resources they have. So in a beehive, there's two limited resources. The first of those is the bees themselves, and the second of those is the, is the flower. So by, by only sending a certain number of bees, you're not wasting bees going to a flower where they won't be able to collect food, and you're also protecting the flower by not depleting it of everything it has so it can bounce back and produce more food for them later. So they're able to use this flow control to protect their limited resource, and that's exactly what we want from our applications. We need to be protecting limited resources by using this form of flow control. Now, another one to protect, uh, another tool we use to protect uh, limited resources or resources under stress is circuit breaking. Now, bear with with this analogy because bees are intelligent beings and microservices currently aren't. So bees can self-diagnose this, but in software, it's mostly due to parental actors or parental microservices. So in the case of a bee, when it gets sick and it's underperforming, it's able to, just like you or I, self-diagnose, it's ill. And so what it does is it actually removes itself from the hive for two reasons. The first of those is it doesn't want to spread the illness to the other bees in the hive. And the second of those is it gives it the bee a break and it essentially enables it to have a, an opportunity to get better. So once it removes itself from the hive, hopefully, after a certain period of time, that bee will get better and it will be able to rejoin the hive. Once it rejoins, it will be able to reperform the role it was performing before. We want exactly the same from our applications. So if I have a microservice that's under extreme load or pressure and isn't coping, it's ill, then I want my parental microservices to be um, analyzing the error messages coming out of that log, realize that, and enable circuit breaking to give that microservice or that component a rest, to give it the chance to get better and get through its backlog. So circuit breakers enable us to protect these limited resources until they're able to get better, get back to where they should be performing, the levels they should be performing at, and rejoin the system to perform the role they should be. So these are just some of the tools you can use. As I said, not a complete and utter list. And they're not specific to reactive applications, but they do help us to implement them. Now, if you wanted to go and build your own application and make it reactive, you could implement all of these individually if you really wanted to but there is an easier way. So there are tons of open source frameworks you can use to enable reactivity within your application. These are just some of them. So they're built on different systems, which I'll explain in a minute. So you've got Akka, Play, and Legom. These are three frameworks built by a company called Lightbend, and they work off the actor-based system. Whereas uh, Vertex, for example, works off something called the a vertical system, so slightly different. You've also got um, Rx Java, which was originally built by Netflix. Uh, again, they're all open source, so they're all free to use. And you've got Spring Reactor. So for anyone using Spring who wants to consider reactivity, Spring Reactor might be a great tool to look at. And then you've also got MicroProfile. So has anyone here heard of MicroProfile? 
Fantastic, loads of hands. So MicroProfile, um, for anyone who hasn't heard of it, is an open source framework to enable uh, better architecture for microservices when you're building Java EE applications. And what they've just implemented is reactive messaging and reactive streams implementations. So if you're already using MicroProfile, it might be worth having a look at those two implementations and seeing if you can implement them to create a more reactive application. Now, as I mentioned, these systems run on different patterns underneath them, and that will determine which, which frameworks you might want to use. So the first of those is the actor model. So you can think of actors as almost the granularity level below microservices. So you can have multiple actors per microservice, or you could have one actor per microservice. It's really up to you. Um, the actor model is essentially a model to deal with concurrent computation, and it's based off this concept of actors. So you can imagine, you can kind of think of an actor as a computational function. So you usually call a, a single actor per function, for example. And what it means is that um, you basically get this hierarchy within the actor um, system. So you usually have parental actors looking after child actors. So if you're after something that has a hierarchy-based model, then the actor system might be right for you. Um, however, it is language-specific. So the actor model um, can actually use Java or Scala implementations, but you do have to use those specific languages. So if you're not using Scala or Java, you might want to consider a different pattern. Um, but it does give you the benefit of at least once delivery which the other systems don't currently. So what happens is you basically send a message between actors. You always have to have more than one actor in a system because that's basically how it works. So you send the message between them and it goes to a mailbox and actors work through those messages synchronously. Um, so it basically stores up in their mailbox and they work through it one by one. So if you do need something that is able to, um, to basically uh, like work through messages without failure, then this might not be the right method for you. Then you've got verticals. So verticals is what Vertex works off. Um, that's a, an open source framework designed by Red Hat. And uh, verticals work by using, well, Vertex works by using verticals as their unit of execution. Um, and what it does is it's basically an event loop. So unlike the actor system, the vertical system is a flat hierarchy in general, um, but it is language agnostic. So you're able to use it with things like uh, Ruby as well as with Scala and Java. Um, but it doesn't enable at least once delivery, it has at most once delivery. So it is slightly different. Um, now each of these you could look up if you wanted to in more detail to find out the main differences and why you might want to use one over the other. So why do you even care? What benefit does this give you um, to why would you want to switch to a reactive system? Well, I'm giving the example of Verizon. So Verizon previously had a monolithic architecture and they were having massive issues when it came to using their application um, with high demand, high user scalability. So what happened was on Black Friday or on the release of the new iPhone or the release of the new Huawei, they were really struggling to uh, enable the website for their users. So what happened was they had to actually shut down components within their website to enable users to buy the new phone or to buy whatever was the most in use at that time. What that meant that other users who were trying to check their contracts, were trying to upgrade, they couldn't access those components in the system, which nowadays just isn't really acceptable. So what they did is they came to us and they said they'd like to switch to be uh, microservices and to be reactive. And that was majorly important for them because most of their interactions were through digital sales. So it was really important that they gave the users the best experience possible to enable those sales. And especially on their mobile devices because that's actually where almost half of those sales came from. So it was really important that they improved that experience for their users. And it did. So you can see here that there were loads of benefits of them switching from this monolithic application to reactive microservices. So they were able to turn their conversion rate up from page visits to sales by 1.6%. They were also able to reduce their page response time. Now there have been loads of studies done by Google, Cook, Pinterest, and a bunch of other companies showing that there's a direct relationship between page response time decreasing and the number of sales and the number of hits you get to certain pages. So it's, this was a really important factor for them to increase um, the number of sales they had and the number of people reaching their website. Not only that though, they were also able to run on an eighth of the infrastructure that they had before. 
that means that they were able to, I mean, having less infrastructure means less infrastructure to worry about. So that means if things went wrong, there was less infrastructure to work, to, to work with, and also le like lower costs because they were using less infrastructure. But not only that, not only did it improve the customer's experience, it also improved the developer's experience. So their deployment time decreased massively. It went from four to eight hours to 30 minutes. So it was far more productive for the developers to work on, which is shown here by the fact that they were 20 to 40% more productive. So it wasn't just beneficial for the customers, it was also beneficial for the developers working on the product. And their order completion time also improved, which led to more sales. So it's kind of a win-win-win situation. Sales were happy, customers were happy, developers were happy. So it was a pretty good situation where we managed to improve almost every aspect of the business. But you're not Verizon, so why would you care? Well, if your application cares about being resilient in the face of failure, if your application cares about being elastic with the use of your resources to enable lower costs and to enable um, reactivity and responsiveness, and you care about giving your users the best end experience, well, maybe reactive is the right thing that you should be considering. If you are going to start considering it, there are tons of resources out there that can help you change from either monolithic or microservice to be reactive. Now, I've been pretty biased with this slide. I do work for IBM, but there are tons of others, other resources out there if you don't want to use our blog specifically. Um, there's a really great course on Coursera done by Lightbend that you can participate in. Um, there are a load of eBooks on O'Reilly that you can access for free. But there is a particularly useful blog that I would mention that we at IBM have produced. And it's basically a blog series that takes you from a monolithic sample application and takes you through multiple different blogs to break it down into microservices and then to gradually turn that into a reactive application. So it's a real step-by-step -step guide throughout the entire end-to-end -end, um, journey that you would be taking. So if you do want an example of that, the code is all on GitHub, it's all open source, and the blogs are on IBM Developer. So that's a really useful one if you want to go end-to-end. So here are some of the links that I mentioned. Um, this is probably the most important slide in my deck. So if you want to take a picture, all the slides will be up later. So the first link is to the Reactive Manifesto. So if I didn't explain that clearly enough or you wanted more details on it, you can visit their website and they have a really great glossary of terms on there if there's anything you didn't understand in my talk. The second one down is that really great blog series I mentioned that takes you through end to end. Then you have a couple of uh, resources there to in case I didn't persuade you enough as to why to go reactive. And if you only have 12 minutes of your time, please visit that fourth link, and that will hopefully persuade you more than I did that reactive is the way forward. I've also linked to a couple of frameworks that I mentioned, so Legom and Acker, and also the last link there is to the CAP theorem, if, it, if you wanted to go and have a read about um, availability and consistency. If you're interested in any of the above, I, I'm also releasing a book. This is a free ebook. Um, it will be released in December. Uh, if you want to be notified of when it gets released, just come and speak to me at the end and I can give you the link to that. Um, and yeah, free resource. And it basically explains why you'd go reactive, which pattern to choose, which is the right for you, and how to implement that. It's only 25 pages, so it won't take too long. So if you did want any of those resources, please do see me afterwards. But hopefully I've persuaded you that if bees can do it, then we can do it. And that reactive might just be the future of your application architecture. Thanks very much. So we have about 10 minutes left. So if anyone has questions, I can do a bit of questions now. Anyone have questions? Or have I stunned you all into silence? Yes, great, brave volunteer. Uh, like, uh, we often have the situation that we have a big monolith, and then we break it up, and then we find like this little, this little, this little, and then there's one that is like 80% left over, so that is so much connected with it. Yeah. Other. What's the question, sorry? Yeah, uh, how, how do you... Uh, how do you break that last bit up? Yeah. I think it, so the question was, uh, often when you're breaking down a monolith, you end up breaking apart, you start by breaking apart the easier um, outside bits, but you end up still with a monolith at the heart of it with additional microservices. 
I think it depends on your application as to whether you split up that 80%, right? It depends on um, not every application is right to be completely split up into microservices. So I think you have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis and you have to decide whether, those, whether that 80% is right as a microservice. Um, I can give you a presentation on how to decide whether that is right. Um, we have a whole technique um, that we use in the cloud garage to determine whether it's right and then if it is right, how to break that down. So if you ping me on Twitter, I can send that across to you. Uh, we've got a whole technique to break that down that I can share with you. Yeah, or anyone else who wants that, just tweet me. Any other questions? But you're right, yeah, it's not always possible. Yeah. Uh, inconsistencies. Uh, if you have like uh, five products, uh, same products, you have six buyers, how do you, uh, uh, you have high availability? Uh, how do you handle that? So you, uh, let me check if I've understood your question right. So if you have multiple versions of the same product, you're saying how do you uh, c c uh, have consistency across all of them, right? Oh, okay, yeah. To access that data. I think it depends on how you want to architect, right? It depends on whether you're using an events-based data structure um, and using like an event-based backbone or whether you're having specific databases. I think to be completely reactive, you need to be splitting up that database um, and ideally using an event-based um, backbone because that way you can do it based on time, right? So the first node that got in has the first um, event on the event log and that's the one that gets the product. Um, whereas if you use a database type structure, you're going to be stuck with locking to try and bagsy basically that product for your particular node. Um, so I think if you really want to go reactive, you need to be splitting up that individual database um, and using an event based or an event source system with an event backbone instead, if that makes sense. Because then it's all down to timing, right? So whichever node is first to put their event in the event log is going to be the one that gets the product. Yeah, and that way you can stay consistent because it's all in the in the central event log. The, uh, problem you uh, addressed uh, in the beginning was like uh, I had my uh, shopping list. Mm -hmm. my item was sold. Yep. So uh, that means, or I have to uh, give the info to the buyer that it's not certain that he has an item, or I only can try, uh, show it if I reserve it. For exactly. Second option. So by using an events log system, um, you basically architect your, you can architect your, it's not how everyone would do it, but you can architect your shopping cart to basically say, okay, only when I get that event into the event log can I say that it's reserved for my customer in their shopping cart. And so in that sense, you're reserving it and you know that it's yours because you've gotten into the event log before any other of the nodes. Um, and so if you did it the other way around, you'd come up with the same problems, right? If you reserved it before you were first in the event log, you'd still have the problem of and it, someone else could come and take it and buy it, right? So you'd architect it so you could only reserve the item if you were first into the event log, right? Yeah. Cool. Yes, hi. Yeah, I have a question. Like, uh, the V's take over roles from each other. Yep. Uh, isn't that more difficult in a service because it would have to know all the roles? Yeah, so it depends on... When I say service, I more meant like the underlying infrastructure. So let's say I have a certain number of nodes or a certain amount of computational power. Um, I'd want to be able to elastically change that to deal with different uh, microservices, so different services in that regard. So if I've got uh, like a certain amount of CPU and I'm wasting half of it, waiting for people to pay for their tape for, for their meal or whatever, um, I should be reallocating that to deal with the book a table service. So it's not necessarily the, the microservice that switches, it's the underlying uh, resources or infrastructure that you'd switch to be more resource efficient. Yeah, but great question. Anything else? No? I mean, if people have more questions, I'll be hanging around. We've got like seven more minutes before the, um, the last keynote starts. So please come and grab me. I should be obvious. I have a B on my T-shirt. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs>